Hello, I'm Natasha Gaskin Peters. I have a PhD in economics and I'm a senior business specialist at the Center for Local Business Development, where I regularly teach the oil and gas industry course. This course I'm about to take you through is one usually conducted at the center located in Georgetown. There are several courses to prepare local businesses to benefit from Guyana's oil and gas sector. The oil and gas sector is a growing and challenging one in Guyana, and this course will walk you through the curriculum offered by the center. More than 1,000 persons have taken this course so far. Further, there have been over 2,000 participants across all center courses, and this number is increasing. However, before we get started, let's take a brief safety moment. Here at the center, we believe it is important to begin each activity with guidelines on how to proceed in case of an emergency. Right now, I'll take you through a safety moment, which generally marks the start of each activity at the center. Where are you currently located? At home or perhaps an office environment? Wherever you are, please take a moment to become familiar with the floor plan of your building. Do you have fire extinguishers and know where to find them? What about for a safe kits? Where are the emergency exits located in your environment? Please take a moment to mark the location of these resources and exits. If the alarm is sounded, you will make your way to the exits in a uniform and orderly fashion and then gather at the dedicated muster point for the building. Also, please make sure you know who the dedicated forest aider is, the location or locations of the forest aid station or stations, and the contents of the forest aid kit. A culture of high safety standards is common across ONG operations. It is a minimum requirement of businesses seeking to provide services and goods to suppliers in the industry. In this course, businesses will receive an overview of the offshore oil and gas industry through six informational sections. After completing all six sections, suppliers will understand the following concepts. Challenges unique to the offshore oil and gas industry compared to onshore methods. The three key stages of offshore oil and gas development, collectively known as the project life cycle. The oil and gas supply chain and opportunities for local suppliers. The history and status of the industry in Guyana. These are the six sections of the oil and gas course. As you can see, we will spend much of the course focusing in depth on the offshore project life cycle. However, you must complete each section according to the sequence they are presented in order to proceed to the next one. The final part of this course, section six, will provide an overview of the industry in Guyana along with a status update of LISA Phase 1, Guyana's first oil and gas project. This is a short section to learn about the course as well as to gain an overall understanding of the following. History of the offshore industry, Offshore versus onshore oil and gas production, challenges unique to offshore, and expected industry trends. At first glance, it may seem that the offshore industry is quite new, but this isn't the case. In fact, Offshore exploration and production has been taking place for over 100 years. Offshore oil and gas well drilling began in California in 1896. 
Many of the earliest offshore wells were drilled from piers in Santa Barbara County, California, as shown by this image here, a photo from 1901 by G. H. Eldridge. It is expected that deep water exploration and production will continue to expand as technology continues to develop and companies search for promising finds in untapped areas. Today, offshore oil and gas production accounts for 30% of the global supply. While the offshore industry has come a long way today, technological, health, safety, security, environmental, and high-cost challenges still exist. This image demonstrates that these challenges and risks increase according to the distance from the shore and sea depth where offshore reservoirs are located. Fixed platforms were initially used for offshore development. These are similar to the first two platforms shown closest to shore. But as more oil and gas is being extracted from deep water fields, floating production facilities have become standard in offshore production. The last three images are floating facilities. A tension leg platform or TLP, floating production storage and offloading unit or FPSO, and SPAR. Currently, Approximately 170 FPSOs, 30 TLPs, 20 SPARs, and 40 production semi-submersibles are in operation worldwide. Orders for floating production facilities have increased dramatically over the last decade. That trend is expected to continue as the world's energy consumption continues to grow and advancement in technology provides capabilities to extract more hydrocarbons in challenging environments. Other advantages of FPSOs are that they retain value because they can be relocated for use at other fields and the abandonment costs are less than for fixed platforms. Guyana's first offshore project, Lisa Phase 1, is located 190 kilometers offshore Guyana in water depths of over 1,700 meters or 5,000 feet. An FPSO called the Lisa Destiny will be used as the production facility for this project and can hold 1.6 million barrels of oil. The FPSO is a floating production system that draws up fluids such as crude oil, water, and a host of other materials, including mud and sand from the seabed from a subsea reservoir through risers. Production facilities on deck then separate these fluids into crude oil, natural gas, water, and impurities. Crude oil stored in the storage tanks of the FPSO is offloaded onto shuttle tankers to go to markets or for further refining onshore. There are differences between offshore and onshore oil and gas. Geographically, the methods differ because of the location of the reservoirs. Onshore drilling refers to drilling deep holes under the Earth's surface while offshore drilling relates to drilling underneath the seabed. This alone will indicate that there are aspects of working offshore that pose unique challenges. Some of these challenges are, one, technological requirements. Offshore drilling is very specialized and creates barriers for companies seeking to work in the industry. Two, HSSE risks are greater in offshore production. The new and more complex risks of offshore drilling drive companies to meet requirements, accreditations, certifications, and standards that are unique to the industry. For example, offshore firms have adopted TBOSIET, which stands for Tropical Basic Offshore Safety Induction and Emergency Training. Tibosiet 
covers offshore specific safety induction, helicopter safety and escape, sea survival, and firefighting and self-rescue training. Three, the high costs of services limit the number of participating companies in the value chain. The technology required and the risk that firms must manage in the offshore environment significantly drive up the costs. The operation of facilities and equipment, such as an FPSO, or floating production storage and offloading vessel, and subsea umbilicals, risers, and flow lines, or SURF, are very expensive. Offshore operators only utilize advanced technologies and they must manage risk with the highest safety and security measures in place. These cost and risk aspects make it even more challenging to mobilize local content in the offshore oil and gas supply chain, which we will cover in greater detail in the next section. Let's recap what we have learned so far. In this section, we have covered an introduction to the offshore industry, including a brief history of offshore production, the importance of high safety standards across the oil and gas industry, the capacity of the oil and gas industry worldwide, the differences between onshore and offshore oil and gas operation, challenges unique to offshore oil and gas operations, an explanation of LISA phase one, the importance of technological development and expertise within the industry, and a basic knowledge of the offshore operation from drilling to transporting. We have definitely learned some really interesting information from Section 1. So Natasha, as people become familiar with the offshore oil and gas industry, many may be asking themselves, what are the differences between offshore versus onshore oil and gas? Aren't they basically the same thing? Yes, Alan, we get this question often in the early stages of this course. Essentially, the differences come down to technology, costs, and risk. Offshore oil and gas operations require a higher level of advanced technology compared to onshore operations. The offshore operating environment also presents greater health and safety risk than onshore. As a result, it is very costly to operate offshore due to the advanced technology requirements and HSSE risk to manage. Good information, Natasha. No. How old is the offshore oil and gas industry and where exactly did it all begin? Well, Alan, while the offshore industry is new to us here in Guyana, this industry has been around for a long time. In fact, it started over 100 years ago in California in the United States. This must be very surprising information to many people to know that the offshore oil and gas industry has been around for such a long time. Can you tell us today how much of the world's oil and gas supply does offshore account for? Today, offshore oil and gas production accounts for about 30% of the global supply. Of course, this could fluctuate over time based on global demand and improvements in current technology. Remember that you can review this section at any time, and if you have additional questions, please post them to the course forum where a CLBD member will respond. You can also visit our website at clbdguyana.com to sign up on the supplier registration portal and find updates on our course offerings. In the next section, we will dive into the core of the course to learn about the offshore project lifecycle. I'm Natasha and I'll see you in my next class as we continue to explore the offshore oil and gas industry.